every society has prostitution, even the Islam has prostitution. I don't get fucked for a Bacardi Cola in a discotheque. I get fucked for 200 guilders. Prostitutes, they, they even are respected. You can have your brothel as a brothel keeper. So they are not really um, pimps anymore, they are businessmen. The right to use drugs is an individual right. It has to do with your body and no government should interfere. The first drug users were was Adam and Eve. There is a distinction between drugs like heroin, cocaine, etc. and marijuana. We are an agricultural uh, uh, nation, yeah? So there's a lot of people who grow their own, uh, their own grass. We are the most of the lowest degree of abortion in the whole world. The people are more tolerant uh, towards black people here in this country. Holland is one of the most liberal countries uh, for gays. It's very free. You can say and, and write and, and do everything you want. So in our country you can do a lot of things, uh, you can use soft drugs, you, you have prostitutes in our country, but we allow it in a way that they don't bother the rights of other people. There is always, always a pragmatic element here. Uh, even if the Dutch people would not like, uh, or they would rather prefer not to have prostitution, or they would prefer not to have any uh, drug addiction. Of course they would uh, prefer that. Uh, there is always this uh, reasoning behind this. How can one either best eliminate this unwanted phenomena or how can one best cope with it? Some people would say, you know, God made the world with the Dutch main Holland. You know, we built half of the country out of the water. The water cannot be conquered, we have to control it by dikes. And sometimes they break through, so we build higher dikes. Like we couldn't eradicate sin within 2,000 years. But we can at least live with it, contain it, control it. Prostitution as such is completely legal. There are some local regulations on prostitution, and there's also a regulation uh, re dealing with uh, people who organize prostitution. Uh, they have to have uh, p permission uh, in their building. It has to be a special size, a fire escape and all these things. Uh, it has to be hygienic and all. There are some measures taken to make sure that everything is going in a good way. I can tell you the story of your Girlfriend, it's okay? It's okay. Yes, this is a small joke. He has a girlfriend, Ingrid. And Ingrid was working at my club. And he thought all the time that she was a nurse. Because in front of my club, you have also a small clinic. 
and she told him that she was working there. After a while, <laughs> he came out the tooth, and then at that moment, he wanted to break my neck. I think <laughs> he want <laughs> he want to kill me. It was very furious. Six months later, he opened the same, and so we became friends. It seems necessary to have prostitutes. It seems the world can't do without them. That's not my wish, it's not what I want, but it seems that this is a fact. I have to live with facts. Well, what can you do? Let have them in a kind of system where they are controlled, where they can go to if they are sick, where they can go to if they want to get out of this job. I visit the sex houses to give education, information about STD and AIDS, about condom use, about birth control, about adequate referrals. If they need other care, then, then health care, like social care. In the same building, you have our own doctor's room with all facilities and the checks of the girls are uh, every week mostly on Wednesday or Thursday every week. There's almost no age in, in, in prostitution people in Holland. Because they're working safe, they're clean. When you pick up a girl in the disco or in the, in the pub and you don't use a condom, so I think the risk is higher than when you have sexual intercourse with a condom with a prostitute. This is not a country where you feel sorry for prostitutes. These girls do it because they like to do it, you know? These girls don't do it because they have to and they've got a pimp that wants money. How can they take advantage of you? They pay for you. They pay. I do something for you and you pay me. So, and if I don't like it, I say it. I just work with a condom and you get have a blow job or fuck. And they can touch me, but not where I don't want to be touched. I can take a lot, so... It almost never happened that I said no. There are only, I think, about three clients that I don't take. And it's because they're too rough or because they're not clean. They smell and they're smelling. But normally I do anything they like. There are not very many problems also that you hear with prostitutes because they're very clear. You knock on the window, you ask what the price is, they tell you what the price is, what they're going to do for it. If you disagree, you can leave. I also work uh, behind the window and most of the men there are talking about their lives, about their children, showing pictures. And it happens a lot that they want to talk and want some attention. Not all the time sex. Some clients are, because they come so regularly, they're like a friend, you can talk to them, you can laugh, uh, they stay hours, uh, we get something to drink, something to eat, we talk about the family, about my family. My first customer was very nice, broke the ice, it was very funny. Like uh, he came in and he asked me how much, and I said 50 guilders for a fuck. And he said, okay, can I smell your feet for 50 guilders? I said, sure, you can smell my feet for 50 guilders. Sometimes you have uh, one or two guys who want five girls. Uh, I remember one time uh, that, we, that the bed uh, was breaking down because there were too many people on it. I just want uh, the nice things of life. I don't want to scrape everything aside to go on a holiday or something. I want a nice house, I want a nice car. I want everything. You can make a lot of money. Most of the time a customer pays two or three hundred guilders for one hour. And then it's 50-50, 50% for the prostitute, 50% for the owner. I make a week what I normally would work one or two months for. If you do it right, you can, afterwards you don't have to do anything anymore. So you can have 10 or 15 guys a day. That's a lot. <laughs> It depends on how many hours I work, but I think about uh, 10 a day or sometimes 5, sometimes 2, sometimes 12, it's always different. This was just a job, just another job. 
right from the beginning because uh, I was very much in love with my boyfriend and I did it purely for the money. For lots of people it's work. So if you're working as a prostitute and you have a boyfriend who thinks the same way, then he's got no, no trouble with it. Then he can think for himself, uh, she's going to her work, she's going to fuck some man, but it's her work. It's not love. It's paid love, but it's not real love. Sometimes there is a gap in the market. One, one uh, man wants this, another one wants SM, another one wants this. You, you've, you've got all kinds of desire. Like uh, uh, anal sex, uh, or oral sex, or, or um, uh, how do you call it, uh, hurt a woman, or peeing on a woman, or something like that. Most women think it's dirty, so they don't want to do it. That's why they come with us. A lot of prostitutes, they have a whole program of what someone wants. It's legal, it's not dangerous, the police is not coming in. It's kind of normal. And in other countries, they are still think it's dirty, it's, uh, you have to go sneaky, sneaky, uh, it's, it's not healthy, and all these things. There's a club in Holland especially made for, uh, for uh, invalid people. Of course, they also need some sex. And, and uh, it's not easy for them to get that. So they can go to a club here, and that's great. We found out that there was a, a, a big need for disabled people to have special facilities. So we rebuilt the place for a year and a half and then we also planned a special uh, room for disabled people. Not only the room, but also the toilets, entrance, uh, shower facilities. There are various uh, grades of being disabled. We even have uh, one customer here that the only sat satisfaction he can get is not uh, through his body, through his mind. If youngsters are going to prostitution, we will do everything to get them out. And there is another uh, thing which we are very keen on, that's the trade of uh, female getting off, coming from other countries. And also uh, what we call child porno is forbidden and they, we will be very firm on this too. The numbers of venereal disease are not higher than uh, in other countries because of the open sex industry. The kids who are going to work in prostitution is less than in other countries because it's open. The general idea is indeed that women are safer in our context than in the context uh, where you make prostitution illegal. There are two big issues. The one is the economical position of women, and the other one is the violence against women. What we say is go to a course where you can defend yourself, so that you overcome the fear, that you know if someone comes at you, that you can defend yourself. And know that there is a possibility to say no if someone wants to have sex with you and you don't want it. And we learn girls at a very early age that you can say no. There is no difference between a boy and a girl in training and fighting and even in the heart. There are a couple of girls who are better than boys with fighting. And we have a girl like Saskia van Rijswijk, the former world champion. Normally I always like to do more than boxing techniques because I really like to use my hands because it's always close and you can do more in a quicker way, I think. And also after that we start with the elbows and the knees. And at the moment the most famous is Corina Geers. And sometimes this girl I have to stop in the dojo because she knocked out a boy. I train only with men. I always train with men. And they are very good. A women can, can box just like boys, but in the, in the past they always say it's a sport for men. So I think women should do what they like. 
boys can do ballet also. Why not? Why uh, the man is going to fight only? The woman can fight also if they want to. Two years ago, I was running in a polo park and I was alone at 6 o'clock in the morning. So I was running in a polo park and the man come and uh, he touched me on my body. Uh, I'd be very angry and uh, yeah, I don't know what I do, but the only thing what I know I kick his uh, <coughs> two times and it was enough. So I'm always afraid, you know, I hit someone so hard, maybe they get an accident, really. I mean, really bad, you know. If a girl hit me here with a good hoop, I'm going down, I tell you. And I don't shame for that because if she knows to hook, here the nerve, you never can block. If you're not blocked, I'm going down, you are going down. They can defend themselves, honestly. I think when you fight for it and you are an able person and you have a good education, you can do a lot here, you can be very equal. In comparison with other countries, the liberties in Holland and the equality is rather good, but not good enough. We are opposed to uh, post oppression. Eh? So, uh, for instance, uh, the, the oriental woman who want here to get a circumcision, we are against that. It is a mutilation of the women's sex organs because men want them to be uh, subdued. subdued and they want them to be sexual inactive. It's an old uh, traditional system coming out of Africa, which has gotten into Islam. The women who come from that culture already say it might have been our culture, but we don't want it anymore. So please help us by saying no to this. It should absolutely be forbidden. And in this country, it's not allowed. Internationally speaking, I think uh, Holland is quite far ahead. We have um, a social movement which is quite powerful um, in the healthcare system, uh, a feminist movement. As regards to cultural and sexual items, I think women in Holland are quite free and um, quite liberated. Here the girls, they are on one line with the boys, you know. We are not like, oh, we are waiting on the bar to uh, get a drink from uh, one boy or something. If they like uh, a boy, they go to, uh, to that kind of boy and they say, hey, I like you, or do you want to drink uh, from me? Here it's normal. What if the guy is not moving at all? You just have to wait and see? I don't like that. It's a part of our uh, culture to talk about sex and give information. We have to be open about uh, how AIDS is, is uh, transmitted. That means that we have to be willing to talk about sexual practices of people. Uh, or we have to be open about the, the safe sex practices. Well, in high school there is a program. It's integrated in the system. The uh, sexual information. Um, technical information, you can get everything you want when it's cool. We have the lowest teen pregnancy figure in the world. That's not only because we have birth control programs and we are more liberal about sex, but if you ask a girl of 15 years old here in Amsterdam, uh, do you want to have a boyfriend, do you want to get married, do you want to have children? She said, you're crazy. The best years of my life are still to come. There is this influence since the late 19th century of social democratic ideas that you have to protect certain parts of the population against being exploited by other parts. And this has all resulted into a type of society in which basic safety is much higher than in other countries. 
if you want economically to typify the Netherlands, you could say we don't have rich people in this country, but we don't have poverty either. The, 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 the range in terms of income is very small, uh, but the average is fair. There is a general welfare program uh, accessible for every member of, of the community, of the Dutch community. They get accessible and relatively cheap healthcare system, healthcare insurance, which is on a, on a high quality level as well. But then the ed education system, system is completely free for everyone. It effectively <clears throat> rules out that kind of really harsh poverty that you would have if you wouldn't have that, that welfare system that guarantees a safety net. That is a, a strong political legitimation for for taxes. Individuals and uh, businesses are taxed in a progressive uh, uh, way. They are taxed from say about 35% up to 60%. So if they have a high income, they, they pay about 60% of their income uh, to income tax. Well, I'm not in favor of high taxes, that's not the problem. That's not the issue. The issue is, is our tax system fair? It's a uh, correction or an addition to laissez-faire. By taking care of the living standards, you also open up new possibilities for emancipation because if you don't have to worry so much about money, you can devote your energy to, to other fields. You know the expression going Dutch, you know what I mean? They know how to handle money. They are good managers. Their freedom is supplied by their economic independence. Hardly anyone works until 65. Almost all use the early retirement system to get out before. There is a film fund. It depends on your script. It de depends on your craftsmanship. But basically there is a possibility to get some money to make a film, yeah. There is also um, a thing like uh, a bibliotheque of art. It's called the Artotheque. And it's also run by the government, and that's kind of a library. There is a possibility that the government is going to pay by social security. Whenever a doctor finds out that one has really mental problems, that he is able to go visit this club and social security is going to pay for them. I'm like trying to convince the government that they should like give me a bigger building and um, that's not too easy anymore like in the 70s that would have been a very very possible thing you know like we were swimming in money in those days and we're giving it away to just about every asshole who could like make a weird uh, dance in the half nude or in some nylon stockings which was called subsidized theater and, uh, but that stuff is over I mean it's really hard to get some money out of the government nowadays the limits of this sort of what you could call soft society are now being discussed and recognized. Uh, till uh, 1990 we had tax rates for up to 72 percent. Now it's 60. So there is a discussion about these matters and most of the people, also the rich people, accept this situation from a sort of solidarity with the poor because maybe we are also rather afraid of situations like you see for example in LA that it's riots from from poor people and poor black people there are no conflicts because of the economic safety net. You know, we all have social security. You have black people from Indonesia, from Suriname, the Dutch Antilles, Moroccans, Turkish people, and of course, in Amsterdam, a lot of people from Africa, Ghana especially. Because of this social system, everything, everybody has a house, everybody has a, a monthly income, nobody starves to death, nobody has to live on the street. So it's, it's, it's very easy for people to just sit by, cozy and live their lives. So nobody really needs to be radical to change uh, the fundamental things of life. 
think there is no country like this. Dutch people, they don't discriminate. I don't think it's a matter of color, you know, it's like a matter of behavior. As they say in Holland, in het donker zijn alle koeien zwart. In the dark, all the cows are black. Well, when I travel to France or to Germany especially, I feel this threat of people, of, of uh, look, there's another one, what is she doing here? That kind of atmosphere you don't find in Holland. It's so primitive to argue about being black or white or whatever, while doing so you miss a lot. And I know that there are societies in which it is uh, very difficult, but I am not from one of those societies. I am from a society in which I can think of things like that, and I do think of things like that, and I like to pass it on to my children. We have a lot of people on a very tiny amount of ground, and we are a very high, dense populated country. So. Being aware of the other one is one of the first things you learn at school, at the street, at the playing ground already. You are not alone. I think it's part of, of our culture that we say we should care for each other. It is our responsibility as a government, as a state, to take care of the health of people, even people who inject themselves. That's why we have methadone as a substitute drug. That's why we exchange the used needles for clean ones. It's just a pragmatic way of dealing with an issue. And if we would not do that, it would only be very stupid to do that, because people will die. And in the meantime, like in many countries, thousands of addicts die already because the government doesn't want to do it, wants just to keep its high morale and high ethics, because we don't want to condone drug use. We have no indication at all that giving out of clean needles is stimulating anybody to inject. Uh, it's just an instrument for them. We see a relatively small number of people using it. In the whole of the Netherlands, 20,000. 20,000 on, on 15 million people is peanuts. Uh, we are dealing with human beings, and uh, some drug users, uh, well, maybe if you and I had been in the same uh, background, we would have been drug users ourselves. Um, and I think uh, people tend to forget it and they look at them as, as junkies, as, as, as non-human beings, but they are human beings and, uh, and I think we should work on, on, on their situation and, and giving them a humane existence instead of thinking that we could commit some sort of a genocide on them and get rid of them like, just like that. We have not the increase in uh, the use other countries had uh, predicted we would have. The health situation of our hard drug users is much better than in the other countries. We have less drug deaths than in other countries. It's not only a matter of repression versus tolerance, it's also a matter of what is the best way uh, to deal with the kind of problems you have in your society. The whole idea of fighting drugs uh, started end of the last century. Then, beginning this century, you get the international treaties. The main international treaty is from 61, the single convention in New York. And almost all countries do participate in this uh, convention. Holland also. So the moment uh, the hippies came around and, and started smoking pot, we started throwing uh, a lot of people in jails for a very long time just for smoking one joint. So our government constituted an official committee to study the problems around the use of drugs. And that committee advised our government to make a big distinction between the drugs with the so-called unacceptable risks. Hard drugs like heroin and soft drugs, cannabis, as drugs with an acceptable risk. In each of the greater cities, uh, it was decided to tolerate one person dealing with cannabis products in a certain disco in a certain town. We cannot legalize it completely because we have this international treaty. In 1970, Milky Way together with two other, say, youth 
clubs in Amsterdam were the three only places where you could get soft drugs easily. They were actually sold by so-called house dealers, people who were more or less put into these youth clubs, uh, tolerated by the city government, because uh, the city was wise enough to understand that you could better have it sold at certain specific places where it was under control, instead of having it everywhere on the street. And from this uh, acceptance of the phenomenon of the so-called house dealer in a youth center or a disco, it gradually developed into deliberating about the possibility of selling cannabis products in a low-level licensed coffee shop. They called coffee shop, but try to get her a cup of coffee. I, I think you won't succeed. At least the coffee is not that nice as the hush. This is the the Bible. <laughs> now we are on, on the page we of uh, exotic uh, products uh, from uh, Nepal, from India. We are coming now on a section of uh, grass, they call it bio skunk. Like here also, we are also selling uh, bio coffee, bio drinks. Uh, we found that together it goes very well, bio and, and hash. You have a choice, for example, you live in France, you live in Germany, you know, you live in England, so you come in Amsterdam and in your country, you know, only maybe you smoke only garbage, you know, and things like that, but here you can have a choice, you can have culture, you can learn what is hash. When you have the grass, huh? And it's uh, and it's fresh. You cut it, you know, and you put it on the on the safe. How do you call it? Screen, on a big screen, and you put everything on the screen. And uh, the thing what's falling off the first, that's the pollen. You know what it is, you know. And you put it together like this, you know. That's that's prime hash. That's that's first quality, you know, best quality. It's called pollen. It's soft. It's oily from from its natural, you know. And it's uh, very nice to get stoned with. You know? We have over 2,000 uh, coffee shops in the Netherlands at the moment. My job is buying the hash uh, and make it ready for sale. I've never been bothered about the police with my job, uh, never. Policemen have a sort, so to speak, a helping attitude. Dutch policemen are really sweet people. Here we talk to police and they're friendly. The country is good here, so the police are good. You walk by a policeman with a joint in your hand and he smiles and says, good day. What's the problem? You can buy your soft drugs, you're smoking your soft drugs and you're not doing anything else. But as long as there is no hard drug dealing, no selling to youth and under the age of 18, uh, and a number of other uh, conditions. If you see the prevalence studies on the use of soft drugs, uh, the Dutch youth uh, doesn't show any, any higher level of, of use of cannabis products. But the main idea between making the distinction between soft drugs and harder drugs is to build a wall between the two. 95% of the turnover finds place in coffee shops in which it is as absurd to ask for hard drugs as it is at the average butcher to ask for a zebra steak. We don't have a crack problem in Holland because between the crack and the young people we built a wall and it's the hashish. There's a sociological stepping stone theory that means when you deal with the people who are selling soft drugs and those same people are selling hard drugs, then there could be a reason to go to harder drugs. When you put those markets apart, that problem doesn't exist anymore. But there is no physical stepping stone theory support. In other words, the organism who is used to marijuana in itself does not long for any other or more or harder uh, drug than marijuana is. You, you do it because you think it's fine. You're not bothering many other people. So you don't have to steal for it. 
because of our tolerance uh, policy, the prices are much cheaper than in other countries. In Amsterdam, nearly everyone have, has tried hashish, has tried marijuana. And we don't have so many criminals. If your son or daughter smokes a joint once in a while, the parents shouldn't panic. Because they don't panic either when their son or daughter drinks beer once in a while. The things people and parents have to do is establishing a normal relation with, the, with your kids where you can trust your parents and your parents can trust the parent can trust the kid. If, if my son say at the age of, uh, now let me say, 17 or so, should use it, soft drugs, well, I, th I, I think, uh, well, uh, let me try it again, after 20 years of uh, having used it. So, so not uh, to make a barrier, but to, yeah, to, to join. I don't have any problem with this getting high. As long I mean, as I don't do it too much. As long as he, yeah, <laughs> as long as he keeps it in, in proportion, that's true of anything. In yeah. the beginning we had also this uh, He wouldn't this let me buy hash. I no. wouldn't let him buy hash. He'd like give me his I would, own, I would be good stuff. buy the hash for him. I, I was his dealer, I guess. You could say. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're a pusher, man. I was his you pusher, pushed me yeah. into taking two. It's very difficult to explain to someone what it means to get high if they themselves have not done it or are not open to it and cannot imagine uh, uh, around it. Expanding. Yeah, so. Cannot what, imagine how expanding expand. your mind. <laughs> what, what expanding your mind, that, what, it, that, what kind of vision, what that can bring to your life, what kind of uh, meaning it can bring, or extra depth of meaning. When we first started uh, growing grass here, it was like you couldn't smoke it. It was horrible quality, nobody wanted it. And now it's uh, excellent. But it took about 15 years. There are of course three kinds of grass we sell, which are the outdoor growing grass, the greenhouse, and the artificial lines. I was growing uh, grass before and after I went growing uh, seeds because uh, seeds are fully legal and uh, grass is still uh, illegal in Holland, uh, although it's uh, tolerated. I started with uh, four varieties and there's 19 now. The difficulty for coffee shops in Holland is that uh, it's allowed to have 30 grams in a coffee shop, but no coffee shop can uh, can be run on 30 grams, so you have, must have more. Well, the decriminalization of uh, soft drugs is de facto. Uh, in, the, in the strict legal sense, it still is forbidden to have any possession of cannabis products whatsoever. Uh, coffee shops, where they sell uh, this stuff, are officially also illegal. But they are, we say, tolerated. The main idea is that it is better to regulate it as much as possible, although it is illegal, because um, hunting for those people who are selling soft drugs uh, wouldn't help. It, it will be sold anyway. You have not the public disturbances. You say you can have nice neighborhoods and still have a coffee shop in this neighborhood. So why go hunting for them? and making it a New York crack scene or so. The laws are for us. We are not for the laws. That is very, very important. We have in Holland the expediency principle or discretion, and that means that uh, the police and the prosecution's department may refrain from instituting criminal proceedings. Of course, it has much more impact than just uh, with respect to using drugs. It has consequences with respect to your views on uh, euthanasia, on suicide, on uh, abortion. It's illegal to get an abortion, but uh, there are a lot of abortions under the criteria which uh, allow having an abortion. You can get it. You, it is paid for by the mm -hmm. 
bij de bij de, bij de insurance. Bij de insurance. Yes. And it is very well done. And uh, from the moment uh, it has been quite open and uh, permitted here, the rate of abortions in Dutch women has gone down. Lower. This is the lowest rate of abortions in women in Holland from the world. Uh, legally, euthanasia is forbidden. Um, in practice, uh, we know there are uh, quite a number of cases in which active euthanasia is performed. If the physician is uh, helping somebody in euthanasia and he's doing it according to some, some, some protocols, some, some, some guidelines, it's not illegal. And we had a study just recently, it's about a year ago, which showed that all the fantasies about the Dutch, that they were killing old people and relatives <laughs> and when you didn't like life because uh, you had a bad day, you took uh, <laughs> a lethal doses. That's not true. Uh, the figures were far, far lower than was expected. It's not uh, disregarding uh, the law, it's trying to get the optimum effect of the idea of the law. Any problem or any issue we consider as, as, as something which you can do something about it. We have always been businessmen. The guy who you have something against it might be your customer tomorrow. So you don't quarrel with him. That's, it's, a, it's a peaceful coexistence, uh, which is really important. Trade is really the prime branch of industry, traditionally already, in Holland. One of the consequences of this uh, outgoing, uh, sailing, trading world over uh, Holland was that they have learned to appreciate or at least acknowledge different points of view. In our system where we have a lot of parties, you have always the necessity to have a combination of parties. Because you need combination of parties, the compromise is already a little bit there. It's very important to have, have a lot of opinions in the society. To have a creative society. To, to, to create new ideas. Yes. I should mention the 60s and the 70s. That's a remarkable period. We once, at that time, were the magical center of the world, as we uh, prefer to say, like San Francisco was for a short while. What that means was that there was room for experiments. They were looking upon the authorities in a negative way and they tried to make fun out of the authorities. There was a lot of international publicity about Provo, what is happening in Amsterdam about all the riots took place, all the arrests of people, and also there was this every month growing anti-Vietnam demonstration. In the 60s, what the provosts were, how they came about, and what they uh, made, the way in which they made things happen, which was much more like, yeah, it wasn't hippie, was much, it had a little bit of yippie to it, but it had a whole spiritual aspect. We started anti-auto happening. We started telling there should be a bike free. Cities should pay for it. Hundreds, thousands of bikes standing in the streets. Anyone who needs a bike, he just take the bike and where he goes, he just leave him uh, and there another one take it. Okay, white bike plan was born. White bikes became the big success of the Provo movements. There is a tradition of being open-minded for over centuries and centuries. And in a way you could say that Holland always had to be that way because we were a very small country in between the world powers at the time in Europe. So you, in order to survive you had to be very open to watch other countries, other influences, other cultures, other people. And this has stayed on and on and on. 
And I think openness is a real basis for being free. There are so many tourists here, they like Amsterdam, just because we are so free. Amsterdam to me is, uh, in Dutch we say La Lekkerland, means like... Uh, How do you explain it? La uh, Lekkerland, uh, where is that? Yeah, something... City of candy. City of candy. Candyland. Candy yeah, Candyland. Lazily like. Candyland. Yeah. But now I think in Amsterdam you have uh, so many different uh, group styles and everybody just can do basically what he wants. Yeah, you create your own reality. Hey, you create your own reality. Yes, you create your own reality. We are the only one in the world who are showing uh, a small museum, uh, something about hemp, something about cannabis, something about the marijuana culture that's existing in the world. Sometimes schools or uh, even police school is, is coming to visit, visit here just because also there's people who really have to know something about this plant, something about the, the culture. Hey guys, uh, you want to see some Dutch cultural sightseeing? <laughs> We've got it all on the stage here for you. Uh, live fax shows, vibrator shows. Uh, you're really going to enjoy it. It's not the windmills or the wooden shoes or the tulips of Amsterdam anymore. Right now when you come back home from a visit from Amsterdam, one of the first questions that people ask to you, hey, uh, did you see the fucky fucky show? Did you smoke some marijuana? <laughs> uh, that's one of the things they want to know because it's still forbidden in their country. So that's a kind of interest for them. I don't feel myself sometimes like a salesman. I feel myself more like a yeah, tourist information. We have a vibrator show, we play games. They can massage one girl. And we have a banana show, they can eat the banana from the pussy. And one girl is writing a postcard with the pussy. The big groups are coming in, bachelor parties. And they can uh, lay on the bar and they take their clothes off. Not all of their clothes off, it's not necessary. Sometimes they uh, the trousers, keep the trousers on. And then we put the body cream on it and we we kind of lie on top of them with the rest, everything. And we turn around and we use a bomb tool for the massage. And they can massage us till a certain point. We can give them body massage, they can eat bananas of the special service from the house, and that's with the pussy. The people coming here for pleasure, we are here for money, so we give them the pleasure. That's business. I'm a normal housewife. I'm going to visit my family go for a swim, the children go out to play with him like a normal mother. I'm also a housewife. I have a kid. She's uh, six years old. And I'm married. So I have a husband. <laughs> yeah, and life is normal. I have a boyfriend for two and a half years. He understands that he tells me because I'm a woman they want to get an, on her own. I want to get work about a couple of years to make some money, to do some business on my own. I like to be free. But when you go to the beach, you always uh, Yeah, you are uh, sitting topless. The current situation in the Netherlands is that uh, we make a separation between the areas where you go nude and where you uh, cannot go nude. Um, on the beaches and uh, around the waters, etc. Going topless, that's not considered nude, that's generally accepted. If you just say in a society it's, it's possible and everybody can go there without restrictions, then it's nice to look one time to, to a lady, you can go there two Saturdays, but the third, the, the, the third Saturday you think, well, probably I have something better to do, and you don't go there anymore. In my own family, the children have seen me naked, and they have seen my, my wife naked. Okay, that, that's normal. It can be an, an advantage of, uh, yes, no, there's no longer a secret, but very puritanistic people, and they see uh, a lot of people uh, naked, maybe they feel embarrassed or, they see uh, wrong things, but then it's in the perception, uh, let's say, 
the dirty mind. I wrote an article specifically on pornography and criticizing in all ways the general juridical tenets on whether anything is offending, uh, shame, public honor or whatever, etc. It's always getting back to primal sin. And measuring a punishment against it is always pure stupid dualism. There's a force of good, as a force of evil going to undermine the whole Christian, civilized, Western, whatever world, under leadership of the devil. I don't think uh, that by banning pornography you ban an attitude which you despise. And um, there is no scientific evidence that uh, males or females who look at pornography are uh, more sexually violent. This is also being brought forward by uh, sexuologists in, uh, in Scandinavia, where pornography is, all, is already allowed for longer time than in many other European countries. And they said, we do not see any sign of the increasing violence after we have introduced the freedom of display I don't think it's good for women or good for men when you ban it. Of course, most pornography is very poor, but you could also have very rich pornography, um, which is really a pleasure, which is really erotic, and which is really, really exciting. And um, this would be nice pornography, and I only see it in art most of the time. My ultimate statement is like to paint somebody because then you can work a lot more freely and just change another personality. People here in Holland don't get so excited anymore about any naked pictures whatsoever in what form about homosexuality or lesbian. It's accepted. They really also think it's a part of the whole art scene. They think just everything must be accepted. Europe, there's so much about sex and porno that the nice things of erotic are a little bit forgotten. And we try with this fair, and I think we succeed with this fair, to give the people an idea again about erotic. We want it to reach a lot of people, men, women, and also uh, children from 12 years. And we thought it is better to leave the sex and the porno for perhaps another fair. It is the first erotic fair in the world. One of the things I like the most in Holland is that uh, not only that you are free to think but that you are free to express what you think and live according to that. That's what makes me feel comfortable and makes me feel free in this country. One of the elements uh, as a background for this uh, attitude in the Netherlands may be the fact that we have fought 80 years to become an independent country. Uh, independent from Spain. The war between 1568 and 1648 was to a great extent uh, a war of a Protestant emerging Holland against the uh, Roman Catholic, the King of Spain. And you could say that during those 80 years people have learned the meaning of uh, an independence religion, independent of, let's say, freedom of belief, freedom of expression and freedom of thought. Large numbers of merchants, um, intellectuals, um, writers, poets, scientists were going to Amsterdam, were going to Holland just to feel free to um, do their business uh, here and there was always an atmosphere of um, 
uh, a possibility to do that. The French Huguenots were uh, driven out of their country and coming to Holland and they find here um, a relatively easy and, and um, good society. The Jews were expelled from other countries, were uh, uh, coming to Amsterdam. I'm a, I'm a war survivor. I have, I'm one of the hidden childs, like Anne Frank. My generation, who was uh, living in that war, in the Second World War, we have a very strong feeling for freedom. Tibetan Buddhists uh, came here. Uh, Back in 19, maybe 1974, I think, or 75, when uh, His Holiness uh, Karmapa came to Europe for the first time, it was much more uh, hippie, you might say, in those days. And the Karmapa was very uh, impressed by, by that and the clouds of marijuana smoke. The Rastafarians are in Holland. Pinchak Silat is an Indonesian martial arts. The Pinchak Silat is done with the Islamic way of life and with Islamic religion. It's an, a national sport also in Indonesia. If you look uh, in Europe, well, Holland is the most uh, important uh, country for Pinchak Silat. Look at the uh, uh, colonialization of uh, Indonesia. Uh, so that's why uh, a lot of uh, Pinchak Silat styles coming to the uh, Netherlands. In the Netherlands there are two things I think very important. The position of the women within the Roman Catholic Church and I think problems around uh, sexuality. For the big majority of the Catholic Church, there's no problem to accept women as Catholic priests. Contraception is totally accepted, also in, uh, in, the, in the field of homosexuality. I live together with one man, have a relationship with another man, and, have female, uh, and also have girlfriends, female lovers. I used to frequent the uh, local gay uh, center. I know um, lesbian women here in synagogue who come here with their girlfriends, and that is really accepted. Women are uh, equal, and they sit together in synagogue, and women um, sing as men do, and they can do everything that men do too. And as I do, some wear uh, a talit, a prayer shawl. Other synagogues in the Netherlands, they're far more liberal. The main Protestant church, of which the Queen is a member, is now considering to start uh, marriage arrangements for gay men and lesbian women also. In general, Holland is considered one of the countries with where, where say, homosexuality is uh, most free. And it's doing much better than most other countries because you've in still had, like for example, in the United States, you have always all these sodomy laws, and in England you've clause 28, and in France the police was killing one of the leaders of the gay movement, and no one bothered about it. It should be completely impossible in Holland to have this kind of uh, things happening, of these laws existing. A woman can have contract with a woman, the same as men uh, can contract with a man and take children, for instance. It's possible here. You have the same rights as a married couple when it comes to housing, getting a house from the government, and even, for example, I'm living together with a boyfriend, and when I die, he will get my pension. There's a policy to prevent discrimination of gay persons in the military. If there are people uh, who are homosexual, it's not, it's not a reason for the Dutch police to say you're not becoming a policeman. Because what he, he, he could be an excellent policeman. 
if the criminal is doing something, he will arrest him in an excellent way, no problem at all. Because what he is doing at home or in his free time, uh, it's, it's not our problem. A very beautiful advertisement they had indeed, the police of Amsterdam, they were saying, uh, we like young men as much as you like them. That was the running gag in this uh, advertisement, yeah. So they were in, in a gay publication looking for agents. Well, it's just normal, yeah. It's part of uh, the culture. It's an accepted lifestyle. Freud said, um, in principle, people are, all people are bisexual, or even pansexual. For many women, I, and I sometimes tell them also in my practice, it would be a rich experience to be touched by a woman. Or, well, if they can tolerate it to have sex with a woman, that is very enriching and makes women less dependent upon uh, men and gives them uh, a richer feeling about their own bodies which is what many women uh, don't have these days. Uh, when I had uh, myself a sexual relationship with a woman I developed myself in... Uh, well, I became freer What has, very, has been very important in the Netherlands, it has been the sexual revolution of the 60s. And also at the same time you had this progressive movement in the Roman Catholic Church. In the 60s, the thousands of Dutch priests met it in that time. And uh, I discovered in the 60s, homosexuality is also my, uh, yeah, uh, my thing. If you look to um, the talking of the Pope, that there is so much concentration on sexuality that I, I sometimes uh, thinking that is not uh, not seen to be all this all this thinking about sexuality. There are more, and I think it's very important to, to try to to move your own Catholic community in the direction of the ideals of Pax Christi and amnesty and Greenpeace. We look at specific human rights violations. Uh, when you look at those, you can see that Holland is one of the countries where amnesty has been having few concerns um, over the years. We have a lot of support here. We have uh, nearly one million members in the Netherlands and over the whole world, Greenpeace has five million supporters. In uh, the Netherlands, uh, we brought in uh, something like uh, 12 and a half million dollars. Sometimes other governments are saying to the Netherlands, slow down, slow down, you're going too quick. On the other side, especially the environmental groups in the Netherlands are pushing the Dutch government too to take tougher regulations than they are doing or they are proposing now. We know that within the Dutch population there is nearly no support for nuclear power. We do not consider nuclear power as an electricity generating facility or as an electricity generating technique. We see nuclear power more in the sense of uh, a radioactive waste generating industry which was set up to in the end make use of the nuclear bomb. Without nuclear power, we at this stage wouldn't have the nuclear threat uh, as it exists. If you cannot even walk outside without being scared of getting skin cancer or feeling hot because of the greenhouse effect, you can't breathe anymore, your health is really affected, how can you feel free to live? In the past we have seen a movement from natural fibers to synthetic fibers and now because of environmental problems we see the swing is going back. The farmers they want crops which bring profit. The government wants crops which can be grown in an environmentally friendly way. So the Dutch government has started a research program on several um, new crops and one of those is uh, fiber hemp. Fiber hemp is a cannabis sativa. The perfect hemp plant does not exist. We know that it can be better. We made the crosses and now we're selecting uh, families and individual plants out of these 
process and we hope to obtain varieties that are better than the existing ones. You get a, about three times more cellulose per hectare from annual crops such as hemp than from a tree crop so that's an obvious advantage and um, the paper quality can be at least as good. Currently wood prices are low because it's um, produced in a non-sustainable way like uh, eucalyptus forests or, or even rainforest in uh, southern America which are being cut down. Anything we can produce of oil, we can produce of plant material. Like uh, fabrics, textile uh, purposes, you, rope is still being made of it. We're looking also at uh, new products such as building materials, uh, composite materials using um, hemp fiber instead of uh, glass fiber with some kind of resin. In the Netherlands, hemp has been a big crop uh, several centuries ago when the Dutch uh, were on the seas. All the, the sails and um, the ropes of the boats were made of hemp. It was already used in the 17th century by Dutch famous painters. They, they were smoking cannabis for fun. Even the cannabis on which they painted on was produced of can canvas, which comes from cannabis. My family in the beginning they said hemp, but now they know what it is. It's normal, like uh, I grow sugar beets. There are many countries in the world where hemp is grown as a, as a normal crop. In France it has been grown uh, very long time and in other Western European countries it was grown and it's still currently being grown in Hungary, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia. Hemp for victory! Are we not talking about a medicine here? because that's also a chapter of the use of cannabis. The effectiveness of cannabis against the nausea in cancer chemotherapy has been proven for glaucoma. It's the best there is at this moment. It has even been proved that the smoking of the natural product has a better action than the synthetic uh, cannabis products that are marketed in the United States. When a natural product does well, why uh, prescribe the more expensive prescription drugs just to stimulate the pharmaceutical industry? Suppose we would come from another planet and we would come down here, we would look at all the different drugs, substances. We would probably uh, come to different decisions on what would be legal and what would be illegal. First. Maybe some people know that these chemicals are not so toxic. If you use them wisely, they're not so toxic at all. Heroin, opiates belong to the least toxic uh, chemicals that people can take for psychotropic use. Opiates are far less toxic than alcohol. Cocaine, if you use cocaine wisely, it's not toxic at all. Only if you're pregnant, you shouldn't do it. Cigarettes and, and, and alcohol, they're the major killers. Just look at, look at all the statistics, it's quite clear. Uh, we get very uptight about drugs and we refuse to look at all the negative effects of alcohol and tobacco. There is empirical evidence that alcohol is much more destructive than, uh, than marijuana in terms of their physical effects and their uh, destructive uh, on behavior also. If people want to experiment uh, the, uh, with soft drugs, and some people feel very good using soft drugs, um, I don't see why we should treat them as criminals. Um, because for some people it may really help them to, to explore uh, the border and, and, and how far they can go. Marijuana, jij geen kwaad, beweren de heren doktoren. And Pietel Dianda has his heart, his house not not lost. You smoke the plants, the plants is growing in you. You feel the plants, so you feel the nature, so you feel good. You describe your own reality, or you determine your own reality. And it, when you smoke, 
that makes it very clear that that's true. For me, it's a perfect way to open up to creativity, making paintings, drawings, dancing, lyrics, stuff like that. I never smoke uh, during my working days uh, before going to bed. My favorite is now the Dutch uh, made hashish. <laughs> We've done that when we were students and uh, it's not a big deal. I've also smoked pot. In, uh, in the 70s when I studied in university. Because you know, you experimented with it. Uh, I cannot inhale. You have to know, of course, your limits. Like, don't smoke uh, every joint behind each other. But sometimes a joint on the couch, before the TV, with your girlfriend together, no problem. It's really uh, relaxing too. I've had a colleague who tried LSD also because he wanted, he wanted to experience what it was. So this is all different kinds of LSD. This is the Gorbachev. So we have the Corby mania a few years ago. And the LSD with the Corby uh, picture on it comes on the market. And that's really interesting. It's, it, it says something of the, what I call the sign of the time. In the 60s, the LSD stands for uh, Tune in, turn on, and drop out. Yeah. LSD was helping you with that. Nowadays, it's tune in, turn on, and the next day, get up early. Everybody likes to experience a certain peak experience. They call it peak experience. Now, for some people, that may be to climb a mountain and stand on the top of that mountain and look down and get all that fresh air coming in. For another person, it may be to use some ecstasy and dance all night with this beautiful girl on the house music. You know house parties, there are a big, a big uh, hall, a big warehouse, and thousands of people go there and have a really nice evening. And 10 or 50% of them, they are on ecstasy. But the market of ecstasy, uh, to find the good pills, it's really hard. There are many dangerous pills. So, we, we start a safe house campaign. People come to me on the, on the floor. They give me this pill. I grab a little bit. And then I watch the color. This orange-brown, it means this is amphetamine. So I say to the guy, you think this is ecstasy? No man, it's peed. So don't take it. Or when you want to take it, then you know that it's peed. And that's completely different. So I have a, a leaflet with peed information. Another guy comes, black blue. This ecstasy. So that's my service. And it works. The Dutch government, they know it. And they are okay with it. We think that people have uh, the opportunity, the choice to do uh, and to choose the drug they want. We can live with this liberal drug policy because we trust the Dutch people. Other countries are constantly emphasizing that fighting against international crimes, fighting against international criminals and trades is actually the, the major purpose of a drug policy. And we always say, no, no, that, that that will put things upside down. That's not what we want. We wanted to, to decrease harm to people. Holland is bound to treaties. We have to deal in an international context. So uh, it's a fight against the war on drugs, actually, that we are confronted with. The Dutch population, Dutch parliament, asked for results. Of course, some politicians have the ideologies too. But we cannot afford to present ideology as results. People will see in the streets what happens. In 1987 and 1990 we did large population surveys. We found, according to us, relatively low levels of, of lifetime prevalence of drug use. Which means that if you have a very liberal drug policy, this does not automatically mean that it raises your levels of illicit drug use to much higher levels 
than when you would have a highly punitive and law enforcement based uh, drug policy. In our society, where drug use is very low, the percentage of cannabis use among the population until 19 years use is 3%, it would be very stupid to have mass media campaigns just to raise curiosity. Because if the, software, if the government would say this is something you shouldn't do, young people say then it must be something. You should not make uh, the use of soft drugs uh, in addition to it uh, being phys physically pleasant, also uh, psychologically pleasant because you have beat the authority to be able to do this. Both the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Health acknowledge that the drug issue has to do with health and welfare. It's not a problem for police and justice. You shouldn't fight drugs, you should fight poverty and the causes that makes people using drugs in an immoderate way. And look at all the countries who are very firm in there's only one way, law and order, using drugs in jail. Are they successful? That's my question. Are they successful? I haven't seen one of them. You can learn it from the American experience in the 30s when alcohol was uh, prohibited. That prohibition, I mean, that is a, a great experiment in the ill effects of, of that kind of pro prohibitive measures. Alcohol and nicotine are dealt with in a pragmatic way. They pay taxes, they have people working for them, vast numbers of people. This is the reason we want illegal drugs to be legal. The second part is, all the money we're putting down the drain to, to jail people won't be needed anymore because it corrupts society. It's too, getting too expensive. My personal opinion is that it would be better to legalize uh, the hashish. And sometimes I even thought it would be better to legalize heroin and cocaine. If you think as a society, well, we can handle it, we can handle that problem, then you can. By making drugs illegal, by prohibiting them, and by applying criminal law to change human behavior, we see a lot of additional problems. Marginalization, prostitution, adulterated drugs, and healthy addicts is not caused by the drug, but caused by the reaction of our own society. It is an unintentional effect of our own drug policy. You try to do it in a better way than just the letter of the law. If you're a criminal, you go to jail then he won't change. You have to change his behavior. You have to change his thinking of what he is doing. We started to experiment with what we call alternative sanctions like 10 or 15 years ago. Instead of sending you to jail, you have to enroll in a, in a course. We have the feeling that you don't learn very much in jail. with a very low imprisonment rate, the lowest uh, in the Western world. It's easy to, uh, to find out that the imprisonment rate is relatively low because uh, you, you make less sentences. And the idea uh, behind it is that you tolerate uh, more variations in behavior. If you make a normal distribution of people and you call the extremes abnormal, that means that uh, Einstein is of course abnormal. But normal in another way is uh, you, you can define it also empirically by probably saying what does a society accept as uh, normal behavior in which the society should not intervene. And then uh, you probably would say that in the Netherlands we have more normal people. If there is an attitude in which the whole population doesn't take offense very easily, then a certain phenomena are brought into the open. Uh, there is a more normal way at looking at human life. I think it's normal if you know where to go, what, you, what your needs are. Uh, like you go to a prostitute to get a fuck. You go to a theater to have fun. We are proud of our workers. We are happy that they are here. 
And it's, it's quite normal. Two times is normal and some girls do more. The homosexuality and, and, and heterosexuality are, uh, are equal. Uh, I think that's a normal thinking. The use of uh, soft drugs is, is just uh, yeah, normal. <laughs> What's a normal life? Eh? What conflict is sufficient to intervene in someone's personal private liberty? That's the point, that's the question. You can't say to somebody you have to be drug tested. It's against the human integrity. So many behaviors could be negative to a, uh, a company, to a firm, that who makes the distinction? This is to be tested, this is not. I mean, let's please preserve people's human rights. I'm absolutely opposed to death sentence. Absolutely. There are too many examples of judges being convinced of the guilt of a person where later on it turns out that this was not the case and that somebody else um, had committed the crimes. Capital punishment is no a real solution to any crime problem. Don't uh, have the feeling that there is no control in this country. That's not true. There is control. Under Dutch law, like for example, guns are completely forbidden. Having guns is the most dangerous condition for, uh, I mean, it never settles anything and uh, that, that, that applies macro and it applies in a micro world. First of all, the highest standard of law or right we have is uh, the human rights. We usually refer to the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which broadly saying, say, talks about the right to life, the right not to be tortured, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of association. Freedom of music, freedom of art, press, print, knowledge, political view, religion, freedom of everything. You can do what you want, you could be what you want. You can express yourself how you want. Everybody can believe what they want. As uh, the United Charter says, that you are free from want and fear. Freedom has also to do with having access to resources, having access to what a society offers. The borders of your possibilities is the end of your freedom. Freedom means to be what I am to the full extent. Freedom is an important word. Tolerance also and responsibility. People should be free to have their, their, their own way to, to handle those things, as long as they give freedom to other people. What is free is to have a, a core within yourself in which you can feel warm towards yourself and, to, and towards another person. The ultimate concern is, uh, do you have a society where it is possible for people to find happiness? with each other. Peace. That's it. Welcome to Right across the deep blue sea Eagle flies into the sun It's a leap of faith Or it's just having fun Take a trip Take what you need Just stand by the silver cloud Laugh loud, laugh loud I know what I want And I get what I need Sex, drugs and democracy Let the truth be told It's simple and free Here, there's no secrets here Who are you?